Hello, and welcome to Lecture 1. What do Nazarenes believe about the Bible? Let's begin with a word of prayer. A prayer of illumination. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life which you've given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So this lecture, we're going to break apart Article of Faith number 4 to explain what do Nazarenes believe about the Bible. We believe in the plenary inspiration of the Holy Scriptures by which we understand the 66 books of the Old and New Testaments given by divine inspiration inerrantly revealing the will of God concerning us and all things necessary to our salvation, so that whatever is not contained therein is not to be enjoined as an article of faith. So the outline of this class is going to be to look at the key words from that article of faith statement. Plenary, we believe in the plenary inspiration of the scriptures by which we understand uh, to be the 66 books of the Old and New Testaments. It's given by divine inspiration, inerrantly revealing the will of God concerning all things necessary to our salvation, so that whatever is not contained therein is not to be enjoined as an article of faith. So that's our outline for the day. So let's jump in. We believe in the plenary inspiration. The word plenary literally means full. The only other place I've ever heard it used is at a conference where you go to the plenary session, which is meant to include everyone, all the attenders, as opposed to the, the smaller breakout groups. Context of plenary inspiration. We believe that scripture is fully inspired by God, able to accomplish exactly what he desires it to do. And we believe that the Bible in its entirety and its fullness was brought about by God who communicated his will and way through the words expressed by his writers. Beyond that, we make no dogmatic stance on how God chose to inspire the Bible, choosing instead to simply affirm that it is fully inspired. How he did it is up for debate. That he did it is not. So we believe in the plenary inspiration of the Holy Scriptures, by which we understand the 66 books of the Old and New Testaments. It's difficult to overstate the importance of Scripture for the Church of the Nazarene. So a basic canon emerged in the second century, but it was not until the fourth century that a final canon existed for the Christian church. A biblical canon or canon of scripture is a set of books which a religious community regards as authoritative, as scripture. The English word canon comes from the Greek and it means to rule or a measuring stick. So another way to say this is it's a basic set of books ruled as holy and authoritative, the canon. The canon for the Church of the Nazarene is constituted by the 66 books of the Protestant tradition. Here's a brief timeline of how this Bible came to be. The Hebrew Bible um, books were written and compiled between 1400 and 400 BC. And in 200 BC, the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek, the common language of of that part of the world in that day. The books of the Greek New Testament were written in the first century after Christ. And in 397, the Council of Carthage finalized the 27 books of the New Testament. Jerome translates the Bible into Latin, which became the common language of the day. And 400 in 1227, the Bible was divided into chapters. 
the English Bible was translated in uh, 1380 to 1382. There's an example of what John 3.16 looked in the, in the Bible before the King James Bible came about. Then the Bible was first printed in 1455, and this was a game changer. Prior to this, most people didn't couldn't own books, and most people couldn't read, and this, this put a Bible in the hands of everyday people. The next section of the Article of Faith is that the the Holy Scriptures are given by divine inspiration. We believe in the plenary inspiration of the Holy Scriptures given by divine inspiration. Now, it'd be foolish to create a doctrine about Scripture that doesn't reflect the claims that Scripture actually makes about itself. So let's take a moment and look at a key passage of Scripture which helps us understand this term, inspiration. 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, All Scripture is God-breathed. That's what the NIV says where the King James says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So the word inspiration comes by way of the, the Vulgate Latin and then the King James translation of this Greek word Theonoustos, literally God breathed, which is found in this verse. So the idea was that the inspiration was divinely breathed into. So let's study the origin of this word and see if we can uh, figure out what it means a little bit better. This is the only place in the Bible of the Greek word theonoustos. Some commentators believe Paul actually made the word up. So it's a combination of three words. Theo, which means God or divinity. Nu, which is breathe, to blow, air in motion. It's the root word for wind. It's also commonly used for spirit. Tos means out. So what part of speech is this word? The tos ending of theonoustos designates a passive construct whereby the subject God is breathing out the object, which is scripture. My translation, all scripture is given by inspiration from and out of God. And so to me, this talks more about who does the inspiring versus how the people were inspired. The question, though, is, is Paul saying this literally or as a metaphor? It doesn't really get into how God actually transmitted this to the author um, as much as it does, he did. So we've looked at the definition of this uh, word inspiration, and we've looked at the, um, the uses of speech. And so now let's look at the context. 2 Timothy is a pastoral and personal letter from Paul to Timothy. Paul appears to have a, more of a practical focus, more than a doctrinal focus, and urgently exhorts Timothy to trust and use scriptures, in this case, we're, we're talking about the Old Testament, to preach, reprove, and rebuke and exhort. Paul doesn't appear to be addressing a doctrinal concern as to how God led the writers of the Old Testament to write what they did or even a debate as to how accurate they are, or how to tell what's literal and what's figurative. He's simply trying to encourage a young pastor to trust in the scripture and to use them as they were intended. I think this is the main point of Theonoustos. It's more to strengthen Timothy's faith that the word he held, read and studied and obeyed and preached, was worthy of those activities. When we read it, we recognize that it's God-breathed or filled with His Spirit and that we need the Spirit's inspiration to help us fully understand its message of truth. I think that gets more at this idea than trying to work out how God actually inspired the writers. Some views of inspiration. Scripture teaches that Scripture is God-breathed and that all Scripture is given by inspiration from and out of God. However, there is much debate over whether God inspired every single word of Scripture or inspired the thoughts of Scripture. In other words, did God take control of the pens of the authors writing letter for letter, word for word? Or did he give them a general idea what to write and they use their own language? Or is there a middle ground that would be more accurate? For instance, did God give them the general ideas and at times inspire specific words or phrases to be used in that flow of ideas? There's a few different 
lines of thinking in this. One's called natural inspiration. There's nothing supernatural about the Bible at all. The writers were simply men who wrote books and letters the same way everybody else does. And over time, their writings have come to hold special significance for people of Christianity. So that's one view that's called the natural inspiration. The second is a spiritual inspiration. It's not the writings that are inspired, but the writers themselves. God inspired individuals, and while inspired, they wrote scripture. Even today, anybody who's similarly inspired could potentially write scripture. The next view is called the partial inspiration. Parts of the Bible are inspired, primarily those related to faith and practice, but other parts may be in error, especially those parts related to history, science, chron chronology, or other matters that do not affect issues of faith. Conceptual inspiration. Only the concepts of the Bible are inspired. God gave inspired ideas to the authors, and then they did their best to present the ideas in their own words. Verbal inspiration. Both the words and the ideas of Scripture are inspired by God so that God partners with human authors to record his word in all various parts and the Bible in its entirety. And the last one is divine dictation. God dictated the words of Scripture to the authors who mechanically recorded them in a passive manner, much as a secretary might only write the words they were told to write. So which one does the Church of the Nazarene believe? Church of the Nazarene leaves room for many positions on inspiration. We believe that Scripture is fully inspired by God, able to accomplish exactly what He desires to do with it. Beyond that, we make no dogmatic stance on how God chose to inspire the Bible, choosing instead to simply affirm that it is fully inspired. Divine inspiration isn't dependent upon the method of inspiration as much as it's about who did the inspiring. Our next section deals with inerrancy. We believe in the plenary inspiration of the Holy Scriptures, given by divine inspiration, inerrantly revealing, revealing the will of God. Church of Nazarene affirms that the scripture is inerrant or without error. And it also states that the Bible is only inerrant in the context of all things relating to salvation. Now, for many people, this, this opens a large can of worms. Inerrancy has been a hotly debated topic within our denomination. 2013, at the General Assembly of the Church of the Nazarene, there was a recommendation to change this article of faith on Scripture from inerrantly revealing the will of God concerning us and all things necessary to our salvation to inerrant throughout and the supreme authority on everything the Scripture teaches. The vote was to keep it, uh, keep it the same, keep it the way it's been. Here's some definitions. Inerrant means free from error, free from mistakes, perfect. Detailed inerrancy means that every detail included in the Bible is without error. An infallible, incapable of error, not capable of being wrong or making mistakes. Those are some terms when it comes to talking about the doctrines surrounding inerrancy. Here's some history on inerrancy. The idea of detailed inerrancy originated in the 1500s with those who followed reformer John Calvin. This wasn't a teaching of John Calvin, but those who followed him uh, took it up. A large aspect of the Reformation was to reform Christian beliefs on authority. At the time, the Roman Catholic Church held that the Pope in the position of the highest authority, as his word was taken as if it had come from God. He was considered infallible. So to oppose that, the reformers quickly held up the authority of the Bible as opposed to the Pope. The problem is, their followers took things one step further. God is perfect, and the Bible is God's word, so therefore, the Bible is perfect. And in some cases, they unofficially made the Bible into the third person of the Trinity. Luther, Calvin, or Wesley never made a claim of detailed inerrancy. From the 1600s to the 1900s, modernism and scientific discovery began to challenge orthodox views of scriptural interpretation. Bible verses were interpreted as scriptural evidence 
that the earth is fixed and immovable. A couple examples. Joshua 10.13, the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. Ecclesiastes states that the sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. Psalm 93.1, indeed the world is established and firm and secure. And so these Bible verses were interpreted in that time frame as scriptural evidence that the earth is fixed and immovable. And the theologists regarded them as clear biblical, biblical absolutes and thus established the doctrine of a fixed earth with the sun orbiting it. Even Martin Luther was still a man of medieval scriptural based cosmology. In 1539, he commented the ideas of German astronomer Nicholas Copernicus, who had made a case of the cosmological system with the sun in the center and all the planets, including the Earth, orbiting it. Um, here's a statement that fool tries to distort the entire art of astronomy. But as the Holy Scripture shows, Joshua commended the sun to stand still and not the Earth. In the 1920s further intensified this issue as evolution took center stage and modernist liberalist views arose. Fundamentalism's view of detailed inerrancy rose in the 1920s as a reaction to modernism. So here's a quote from Martin Luther on scripture that I do like. The Bible is the manger in which Christ laid. With that concise and graphic metaphor, Martin Luther explained his view of Scripture and that the manger itself was not the shepherd's ultimate goal. They were looking for the newborn babe, and the manger was simply the place where the angels told them to look. So the point, I think, of Luther's analogy is that Christ, who is the living word, is found in the Bible, which is the written word. But the latter is simply an instrument directing us to the former, and thus not an end to itself. So a lot of times some of these uh, doctrines around inerrancy make the Bible the main part of the story and forget that it's really just a manger in which Christ is laid. The Nazarenes believe there is another different way to encounter both extremes um, that are just presented of biblical interpretation. Nazarenes believe there is another different way to counter both of these extremes of biblical interpretation. In it we reject both the literalist and the liberalist. We reject both ends of the extreme, the detailed inerrancy and all the way to the other that it's just a book about God and instead see God's infallible inerrant purpose for scripture as really to guide us to his words Jesus Christ. In the words of Augustine echoed by John Wesley, in essentials unity, in non-essentials liberty, in all things charity. I believe that sums up the Nazarene's view on inerrancy. So moving on to this next section that connects to inerrancy. Inerrant, inerrantly revealing the will of God concerning us in all things necessary to our salvation. Scripture provides us with everything we need to grasp a perfect picture of who God is, what he's like, and what he wants. Scripture provides everything necessary to our salvation being saved from ourselves, our sin, and for an endless relationship with God. This is the purpose of the Bible. When we hold tightly to this purpose, we can loosen our grip on the ideas of the Bible being an almanac, a history book, a science text, or a how-to manual. You might have noticed that the object of inerrancy is God's will, and not factual details contained within Scripture. Why? His will regarding salvation needs to be held as the most important goal. No matter how perfect we think we are, as human beings, we're not without error in our reading of or interpretation of the Bible. Always, We're always interpreting what we read or hear through our own lives, backgrounds, personalities, experiences, and so did the biblical authors. Could there be slight miscalculations or personal impressions in Scripture or the interpretation of Scripture? Sure. Do they take away from the point of what was being communicated? Not at all. This means that we bear the responsibility to use all the tools and resources possible to dig into the depths of what God is saying to us regarding His will and gave us brains for a reason. We are also given the gift of the Holy Spirit. Here are a few words from Scripture about the purpose of Scripture. This is the story of Jesus after His resurrection walking with some disciples on Emmaus Road, and he said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. 
everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. That's the Old Testament. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. Again, the Old Testament, he told them, this is what is written, that Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. This reveals to us the person and work of Jesus Christ. It's been said that all the Old Testament's written to look forward to Jesus and that all the New Testament is written to explain Jesus. And then in doing so, both portions of Scripture look to the central salvation event of Christ on the cross. Jesus summarizes the gospel uh, message well in this passage. 1 Corinthians 15, to 3 For what I received I passed on to you as first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So Paul teaches us in this passage the gospel message, which is uh, summarized most simply, and that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again on the third, third day according to scripture. Paul seemed to indicate as well that the primary purpose is the revelation of the gospel message. It is for this reason that we say Scripture inerrantly reveals the will of God concerning us in all things necessary to our salvation. Timothy three fourteen to 16 But as for you, continue in what you've learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from who you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scriptures God breathed and is useful for the teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Paul teaches clearly what scripture is for, making us wise for salvation through faith, teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. There's also a purpose and intent to the scripture that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We don't read scripture for the purpose of education or entertainment, but so that we might encounter the living God within its pages and be transformed into his image. And then by being transformed into his image, we're equipped for doing every good work. Scripture reading is not solely for edification, but for the edification of others. What did John Wesley uh, say about this? Well, he identified Scripture as the most basic authority for Christ's uh, Christian's faith and life. He approached Scripture in terms of the best scholarly principles of his day. He focused on the major salvation themes of Scripture and sought to interpret all passages in their light. He was explicitly aware that Scripture did not definitively address every possible issue. The Church of the Nazarene affirms that the scripture is without error on any matter relating to salvation. Church of the Nazarene doesn't assert that any errors exist in the Bible on any account. Rather, our focus is that we affirm that the scripture asserts its authority in matters regarding salvation, teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. The Bible exists so that a child of God might be completely equipped for every good work. This last section of the article of faith um, it's a little confusing. It feels a little bit more like legal language than theological language. So that whatever is not contained therein is not to be enjoined as an article of faith. Church of the Nazarene understands that all its doctrine must be grounded in the faith affirmations of Scripture. So here's the statement as a whole, but this, this middle section really explains... Uh, in detail what the Holy Scriptures are. But I think that the last part makes more sense when read like this. We believe in the plenary inspiration of the Holy Scriptures so that whatever is not contained therein, so what's what's not in the Scriptures is not to be enjoined, is not to be added, is not to be uh, connected to a foundation, an article of faith. In other words, we believe in the God-inspired Bible. And that if it ain't in there, it ain't foundational to our faith. So on one hand, we do not want to make absolutes out of things that are not absolute. 
But neither should we succumb to making nothing absolute. Instead, recognize God's word for what it claims to be, the inspired word of God, which reveals to us God's plan for salvation for our lives. The scripture answers the questions of substance concerning matters of faith, where it's clear there is no room for other perspectives. It is most authoritative at the point where it helps us to understand the nature of God and the meaning of His grace. So what do Nazarenes believe about the Bible? We believe in the plenary inspiration, that God fully inspired it, and that the scriptures are fully inspired. We believe in the plenary inspiration of scriptures, by which we understand it to be the 66 books of the Old in the New Testament. We believe it was inspired by God himself. I'm not really sure the, the methods, but we believe that the scriptures are divinely inspired and that they are inerrant, revealing the will of God concerning us in all things necessary for our salvation. And in regards to those scriptures, whatever is not contained in them is not to be enjoined as an article of faith. Thank you. Look forward to discussing this stuff with you in class on Saturday. Have a good one.